Welcome back everyone. We're going to start the lecture today by talking about memory and learning. Clive Waring is one of the most curious clinical cases of enterograde amnesia that has ever been carefully documented. Enterograde amnesia means you cannot form new long-term memories. Waring was a musicologist until in the mid-1980s. He had a serious infection that uh, destroyed his ability to form new long-term memories. It's interesting case because uh, he can still play music, but he doesn't remember having ever learned to play it. Uh, and uh, it's a very interesting case. It's his wife seen on the screen here, Deborah, who has written a book about their life together and carefully documented what it is like to live with someone with enterograde amnesia. Uh, here's Clive playing the piano and just minutes before, he insisted that he had never learned to play the piano. And just a few minutes after this, he will have forgotten that he was able to play it. How is it uh, that learning works without memory? Okay, but well, why are we talking about interrogate amnesia? Well, it turns out to be very relevant to statistical models. Uh, we're going to pick up with the problem we ended on in the previous lecture and try to develop a solution to it in this lecture. So to remind you, we were working with the trolley problem data and we had tried to work through the different complex moderators of the treatment effects uh, that you can see in the DAG on the right of this screen. But we had stopped when we had reached the last two and those are the 12 different stories in the data set. The stories are the different scenarios that are used to construct specific trolley problems in the experiment and the 331 individuals who uh, volunteered their time to uh, rate the different trolley problems. Uh, how are we going to put these categories into our model? And there are lots of choices to make and we'd like to make a very principled one. Let's look at the data in a, a more natural kind of perspective. So what you see on the left of this slide are the 12 different stories um, are just laid out on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis, uh, the response variable from the trolley problem data. That is this one to seven rating of how appropriate uh, the action in the story was. Uh, the um, pink intervals represent the 50% uh, uh, intervals uh, uh, for each story in this case. Uh, and then on the right of the slide, I'm showing you the uh, same sort of plot, but for participants in the story, just the first 50, because there's uh, 331 and, and that doesn't really fit on the slide in a nice way. In both cases, what I want you to see is there's variation, uh, both across stories and especially across participants, uh, where some participants really uh, assign almost everything a rating of seven and others almost everything a rating of one. Other individuals use the whole range. Uh, some individuals uh, uh, stick around four all the time and play it safe. But also for stories, uh, some stories uh, appear to be consistently uh, uh, lower rated than others. So how are we going to model this and um, put this into our, our statistical approach? Well, the most obvious way would just be to take our GLM strategy and create a vector of parameters here for the stories. Uh, let's call it beta, uh, for the lack of a better name. There would be 12 parameters in this vector, and then we just use the stories index as a regular index variable um, to index which parameter we need uh, for each particular response. The problem with this approach, this approach can work. It's, it's not doom, but the problem with it is that it has interrograde amnesia. As the model moves from one response to the next, from one story to the next, it doesn't use anything it's learned about the previous stories to help it uh, learn about the next story. And maybe that sounds a little odd, so I'm gonna build this up uh, over the next several slides. What we want are models that remember and use those memories to uh, efficiently learn about new cases as they arise. And this is what multi-level models do. Multi-level models are models within models. 
The first kind of model in a multi-level model is the type that we've been using all along, this kind of generalized linear model that we've been using for weeks. And this is a model of the observed groups or individuals in the data. And then the second model in a multi-level model is a model of the population of those groups and individuals. And that includes unobserved groups and individuals. Why would that be useful if we haven't observed them? Well, because the population model creates a kind of memory. And that memory is extremely useful because it generates expectations uh, for uh, the first observations and, and the second observations and so on for new groups. And expectations help us learn faster because when expectations are violated, then that is that kind of surprising result tells us to update more. Or rather, it tells our little Bayesian machines to update more. Um, there are really two perspectives on why we would like our models to have a kind of memory that creates expectations and, and can have them violated. Uh, and they're both simultaneously true. It's like that, that old illustration of the, of the duck and the rabbit that you see on the right of the slide here. If you look at it one way, it's a duck with the beak on the left, and the other way, it's a rabbit with ears on the left and its face on the right. Um, and this is true of these perspectives about models with memory, multi-level models as well. Uh, you can think of them as being superior um, to single level models because models with memory learn faster as they make more efficient use of the data you have. Uh, and the other perspective is that models with memory resist overfitting. They regularize. If you think back to our previous lecture about overfitting, uh, we're gonna tie all that back in today. Uh, to the models here. And both of these things are simultaneously true and they arise actually for the same reasons. And so by studying these models as well, you can learn something more about how statistical learning works. Okay, let's take up the first of those perspectives. Uh, suppose uh, we go to Prague and we have a golem, a coffee golem that's gonna visit various cafes. Uh, here's one of them. And he's gonna order coffee and he's gonna record how long the wait is to get the coffee. And by going around the city and ordering coffees, the golem is going to build up a database of the uh, distributions of waiting times at different cafes. How should we program our golem to do this optimally? Okay, so let's do this actually uh, in a computational sense. Uh, by in a computational sense, I mean I've done the calculations and I'm going to show you the cartoon version of them, how they look on the screen. What I'm showing you here is uh, just one cafe. We're going to call it Cafe Alpha. And uh, the horizontal axis uh, in, in the two plots on the screen represent waiting times. And this is the dimension of the outcome we're interested in, how long it takes to get your coffee after you order it. And the vertical axis is density because we're showing uh, posterior distributions. Uh, and so the uh, red curve in the middle here is the uh, golem's initial programmed uh, prior, if you will, uh, for the waiting times at Cafe Alpha. It hasn't visited Cafe Alpha yet. We're just letting it out the door. And then the blue density represents the initial memory the golem has. It's its set of prior expectations about the population of cafes. It expects cafes to vary, uh, but it, it thinks that most of them will have waiting times uh, less than 10, uh, the vast majority, less than 10 minutes of waiting time. Uh, now let's let the golem visit a cafe. It goes to Cafe Alpha in its first visit, and it gets its coffee in about uh, two minutes. Now, uh, this is just one visit. It updates. Uh, this golem is Bayesian, so it uses Bayesian updating to do this, of course, and it gets a um, uh, new posterior distribution, but it gets it for both Cafe Alpha, as you see in the middle. It's updated to the red curve, and I, I show the gray curve is the previous posterior distribution, the prior distribution, so you can see what's changed. Um, but also the population of cafes has changed. The blue curve is now spiked uh, at um, what, it, what the golem thinks Cafe Alpha's average waiting time is. And this is after only one visit though, so this will be easily overwhelmed by future data uh, 
But so far, this is just an example of Bayesian updating. And there's really nothing new, except for the fact that, of course, the visit to any one cafe has given the Golem information about the population of cafes. So it has changed two things. It's changed its uh, expectations about a particular cafe, and it's created a memory, if, it's will, if you will, about all cafes and what they're distributed like. Now let's consider a second cafe that the Golem's going to go visit, and that's Cafe Beta. Before the Golem has been to Cafe Beta, uh, it has an expectation about it, and that expectation is not the original distribution of cafes. It's not the same expectation it had before it visited Cafe Alpha. Uh, its expectation about Cafe Beta is now informed by its visit to Cafe Alpha because it remembers that visit, and it has used that memory to update its prior for Cafe Beta. And this is what happens when there's memory in the model, when you have an explicit population model, as well as just a model for the observations themselves. <clears throat> and so Cafe Beta's expectation, you can see here, is not the gray curve where all the cafes started, but it's the red curve. It looks a lot like Cafe Alpha, but it's not exactly the same. It's a little bit closer to the population distribution. And now, our golem's going to visit Cafe Beta, and it gets a really long wait time. Yeah, cafe Beta is not not such a well staffed cafe, and uh, uh, there's been a big change in the in the posterior distribution from the prior for Cafe Beta. You can see that. Um, however, it isn't uh, the, the red curve for Cafe Beta is not piled up on the on the vertical black line. The observation because the prior is exerting influence, and it's just, this is just one coffee. Right, so it's a limited amount of evidence. What I want you to notice, though, is that the estimate for Cafe Alpha has also changed. Uh, and that has to be true if our golem is going to learn optimally. Um, and the reason is because uh, the optimal golem will remember visit, that it visited Cafe Alpha. And the new information from Cafe Beta uh, forces it to revise its estimate for Cafe Alpha, even though it's not in Cafe Alpha anymore. But it hasn't forgotten it. And it hasn't forgotten it because the estimate for Cafe Alpha depends upon the estimate for the whole population. And when the Golem visited Cafe Beta, it updated its estimate of the population of, of, of cafes. You can see that on the left in blue. And now the uh, distribution has been pushed out to the right and it's flatter. The Golem expects more variation because the wait time at Cafe Alpha, the first cafe, was short. It was only about two minutes. And uh, this one is about, what's that, 18 minutes or so. And so now the golem thinks that maybe cafes are quite different from one another. They're not all the same. <clears throat> Can come back to Cafe Alpha and get a second data point, and Bayesian updating proceeds. And at every visit, the golem, uh, following its optimal programming, updates uh, both every cafe it's visited in, as well as the population of cafes, its posterior distribution for the population of cafes. Uh, and we can keep doing this. And uh, after three visits to Cafe Alpha, it sure looks like Cafe Alpha is the better cafe of the two. Um, but we can think about adding even more cafes. So maybe three others here, Cafe Gamma, Delta, and Omega. And the Golem hasn't been to them yet, but you see it has a prior now, which is informed by the population distribution. It now expects more variation. And so the prior for these three cafes it hasn't been to yet is flat and long. It doesn't know what to expect. Will it get a Cafe Alpha or a Cafe Beta, where service is not so great? Uh, and it can go to the different ones and uh, get its coffees, and at each step it updates. And I want you to notice is all the cafes move a little bit, no matter which cafe the Golem goes to, as well as the population of cafes estimate also moves. And that's because for the optimally learning Golem with a memory, um, every visit has implications for the estimates of every cafe in the population. But as more and more data accumulates, of course, the evidence for each cafe will eventually overwhelm any information from the population. But when you're just starting out, you don't have a lot of experience, this makes a huge difference to have memory and use that to develop expectations. And at the end here, the golem is going to visit Cafe Beta again, the one with the long wait time. And again, it gets a long wait time, much longer than all the others. Um, 
and uh, it has now pushed its posterior distribution back up to the right, away from where it had been in the gray curve, shrunk back towards the other cafes because the golem was becoming increasingly skeptical that it's one coffee that it ordered early on at Cafe Beta was representative of Cafe Beta because the other cafes had all given it a good experience, as you can see. Uh, but in the end here, we see that uh, we get another uh, long, slow coffee from Cafe Beta and the Golem updates appropriately. Okay, that's one perspective and what memory does. And we're going to deal with the computational structure of all that in a bit. Just be patient. Um, I want to show you the other perspective first, though, and that is the regularization perspective. And it's the same. It arises from the same logic, but it really feels different. Uh, each of just like again the the duck or the rabbit uh, so the other reason often given to use multi-level models is that they adapt adaptively regularize your estimates um, so you remember back in the overfitting lecture regularization means finding uh, a set of estimates that are neither overfit nor underfit that make good out of sample predictions <clears throat> and cross-validation was one method uh, we discussed to do that. Another way to talk about this is that, uh, from a statistical perspective, is that there are three kinds of models we might use to learn from a data set that we're going to make predictions with. And the first is the complete pooling perspective. And in this case, we will treat all clusters in the data. And what clusters means here is uh, stories, individuals, any kind of unit with repeat observations, cafes if you will. Uh, in the complete pooling kind of statistical model, you treat all of the different cafes as identical. And this tends to result in underfitting if there's any interesting variation among them. So you think about the cafes again. Uh, uh, there are cafes that are quite a lot worse than the others in terms of how fast the coffee comes. Maybe it's worth waiting for that slow coffee because it's better, but the waiting times are different. If you collapse all the cafes together and have only one estimate for the amount of time to wait, um, you're underfitting the variation in the data. <clears throat> You'll make poor predictions because your model wasn't flexible enough. In the no pooling perspective, uh, instead you treat all clusters as if they were unrelated. You have a unique parameter for each and no memory in the model so that uh, none of your visits to any to cafe alpha will inform your estimate for cafe beta. It's like every time the golem goes to a new cafe, it forgets that it's ever been to a cafe. And that's not good for learning. The compromise solution is called partial pooling. And this is when the model tries to adaptively learn the amount of variation in the population of cafes or individuals or stories. And that's what the, the coffee golem was doing. Let me show you what this looks like. Uh, and why try to give you some intuition for why partial pooling is a good idea. I'm going to use a, a data example. This is the same data example that I used to motivate multi-level models in the book. Uh, it's a relatively small data set, 48 rows. Um, this is in data read frogs in my rethinking package. And each row is a group of tadpoles. I call them tanks, but maybe it'd be better to call them buckets. Uh, these are experimental groups of tadpoles um, that develop together. And uh, there are three experimental treatments in these 48 groups. The first is the density of tadpoles in each tank. And that is the number of tadpoles that are in the tank. Uh, and second is size, which is how big the tadpoles are when they were put in the experimental unit. And the third is the presence or absence of predators. And that was manipulated by covering and protecting the tank or not. The outcome of interest is survival, the number of tadpoles who survive. We're going to use these data uh, to think about, well, overfitting and regularization and the value of models with memory. Let's dag it out here a bit. Uh, this is an experiment, and the reason I've chosen this particular empirical example is because it is a controlled experiment. And so uh, for the most part, we can um, put the issues of confounding and such behind us and just think about the estimation problem for now. And that's the goal of this lecture. Uh, of course, in real studies, confounding is always haunting you. Uh, but let's put that aside. We've dealt with that for weeks now. And let's think hard about getting good estimates.
So in the DAG, we have in the middle there our outcome of interest, survival. Uh, this is going to be in the data, the number of tadpoles who survive. <clears throat> Um, and then we have the three experimental treatments, density, size, and the predators. And then there's also the tank. And the reason we're interested in the tank as a variable is because there may be unobserved things about each tank that, that explain, the, uh, no, explain the numbers of tadpoles that survived uh, in, each, in each case. There would be some heterogeneity among them due to other issues we haven't observed. Think of it as a competing cause, like story. Okay, so uh, here are the raw data, just plotted out for you so you can see what the structure of the data set looks like. Uh, the horizontal axis is just the tank index, and I've grouped them. So on the left, you have the, the low density tanks, well, I'm going to call the small tanks, and in the middle, the middle density tanks. Uh, and on the right, the high density tanks. And the vertical is the proportion of tadpoles in each tank that survive. And the black dots um, just show you that proportion. The uh, horizontal dash black line is the average survival across tanks. Now, yeah, and that means the average of these black points, right? It's not the rate of survival across the whole experiment. It's if you take the rate of survival in each tank and then average those rates, you get that black line. It's a feature of the population of tanks, um, marginalizing over their densities and so on. We're going to model these data. We're going to use it to think about regularization and the value of multi-level models. OK. So let's make a little model. And let's make a model that doesn't have any memory. This is going to be an ordinary binomial GLM, like from uh, a few lectures ago. Uh, but now we're going to think about the prior in a little more detail and uh, explicitly vary it and see what that variation um, does to our estimates. So just to show you on the right and review, uh, we have S sub i, which is our outcome variable in this case. And that is a binomially distributed variable <clears throat> because it's a count with a known maximum. And that maximum is the density, D, of tadpoles in that particular tank. Uh, and then we have a probability, P sub i. And we're going, to map, uh, we're going to model that on the log odd scale with the logit link. And the linear model is really simple here. It's just uh, a log odds parameter alpha specific to each tank. Uh, each, uh, each row i has a tank that it is attached to. And so we model that with the T of i. And then we have a vector of those alpha parameters. And each element of that vector uh, gets a normal prior. And it'll have some mean alpha bar because there's a, an average um, survival, uh, log odd survival across all tanks. And we want to model that. Uh, and the question that's going to uh, interest us here is what kind of standard deviation should we assign this prior? Um, so there's a lot on this slide, uh, but I'm going to take it slow, and uh, uh, we're going to get a lot out of this. So at the top, uh, I've plotted the data again. I think you'll recognize it. And then I've added a bunch of estimates, the little, little red uh, dots with the, the pink uh, confidence regions on them. Um, those are 89% confidence regions. Uh, these are uh, estimates for each tank, the, uh, the little alphas for each tank. And these have been estimated for the sigma shown at the very top. I have plugged in um, a standard deviation. This isn't a parameter. It's just a number that I plugged in for the standard deviation of the prior for each of the alphas. And I made it very small to start with, 0.1, 1 tenth. And what happens as a consequence is that we get a really narrow uh, range of estimates hugging the mean, which is alpha bar. Right, the, the mean estimate near the black dashed line. Uh, and at the bottom, uh, in the bottom plot, I'm showing you that posterior distribution for the population that is this the alpha j distribution. Um, that is, what is the prior for each of the tanks? 
Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to let sigma increase, and we're going to increase it all the way up to 5, and, uh, and then back again. And you'll see that as we manipulate sigma, fixing it at different values, um, it lets the distribution of per tank estimates change. So here we can increase it up to 5, and I'll freeze it here for a second, and you'll see we get basically the opposite result as what we started with. Now all of these uh, individual tank estimates, the individual alphas, are quite dispersed, and they're much closer to the black dots, uh, as you'll see, because now uh, the prior isn't constraining the estimates to be near the mean. It's a very flat prior. It's much, much more flexible, and so the model fits the sample much, much better. At the bottom, uh, you can see as well um, what's going on here is that each of the vertical bars is one of the um, alpha estimates that's also shown in the top. So you can see how they're distributed uh, uh, relative to the prior. Uh, something to note here, I think this is important, it'll come up again and again, is that even though the prior for the alphas, for each alpha, is normal or Gaussian, um, in the posterior distribution of a Bayesian model, uh, that prior doesn't force the distributions to be normal. So that you see that uh, all of these uh, vertical uh, red lines at the bottom underneath the Gaussian curve, they don't form a Gaussian distribution. You've got those high ones up there on the right. You've got clusters on the left. Uh, and that's just because there's nothing that says that a posterior distribution has to be of the same shape as a prior distribution. So when we use a Gaussian prior for any particular collection of parameters like these alphas, that's not forcing them to be Gaussian in the posterior. They can have whatever distribution they need to. Um, okay, <clears throat> so uh, oh, I should also say that you'll see that alpha bar has moved now. It has shifted away because of the uh, dispersion, if you will, of the um, individual alpha estimates. As you can see it there. Now we can let this thing uh, go back and forth a few times and you can get a sense uh, of how it looks and how it works. And as it shrinks up and uh, shrinks back down, it spreads out again as sigma goes up to five and then back down. Um, it's clear that when sigma is 0.1, it's not a good model. That prior is way too tight and the model's not fitting the data. It's underfit, radically underfit. And we'd expect it to make really bad predictions about any additional uh, experimental groups of tadpoles that we would try to understand. Uh, on the other end, when sigma is a very large number, uh, five, it could possibly uh, overfit the data. The model may be too flexible, may be insufficiently skeptical. And I've been encouraging you all along for weeks now to choose more skeptical priors than something like a sigma of five. So what's the right sigma? Uh, is, and there's, there's different ways to approach this, but I'm going to use an approach that you've met in a previous lecture. Let's think about cross-validation. Which of these sigmas uh, gives us a good cross-validation score? So we can take this whole sequence again, and we can compute the uh, PSIS, the uh, Pareto Smooth Important Sampling cross-validation estimate for each sigma that we might use. So at the bottom here now, I've replaced the uh, plot of the prior distribution of alphas with um, uh, all the sigma values uh, that we're going to vary over. And uh, this is a log scale, the way the spacing is done, but I've labeled it with the uh, normal uh, natural scale sigma values all the way from 0.1 to 5 on the far right. So uh, right now we've got 0.1. You can see this gives us a PSIS score um, uh, somewhere above 500. And remember, lower scores are better. So now I'm going to start uh, the movement again, and we're going to calculate all of the different PSIS scores for all the different sigma values. And there's a pattern here is that uh, true, uh, very, very low sigma is quite bad. This is a radically underfit model. And as sigma increases, um, the PSIS score improves, it means it goes down. And, uh, but eventually, starting around 1.2, uh, there cease to be any substantial improvements. And after a little while, in fact, uh, above three, you can start to see it, the PSIS score actually starts to go up again. And if we used even larger values of sigma, you'd see that trend continue. Um, okay. <clears throat> 
So you probably expect this, or at least we should, from the information presented in the overfitting lecture. Uh, uh, priors can do a lot to regularize estimates, and um, tighter priors often give us better out-of-sample predictions, even though they make the model fit the sample worse. Uh, however, if the prior is too tight, as it is on the far left here, then that's also bad, or even much, much worse, as in this case. Uh, so uh, the best values right around here, around uh, 1.8, although there's lots of values in the same area that are essentially the same. It's a bit of a plateau here. Um, this is the value that, uh, in expectation at least, maximizes our out-of-sample accuracy, uh, is a good regularizing value. Uh, if we zoom in a bit at this uh, area now and look at the estimates, there's some interesting stuff to see. So now, to remind you, the black points are the raw data. That's, that's the empirically observed proportion of tadpoles that survived in each tank. The uh, red dots and the, the smaller vertical intervals uh, uh, on each red dot, that's the posterior mean at the red dot. That's where the model thinks. Um, uh, the expectation is for a tank, that tank uh, or tank with those features. And uh, the um, uh, smaller red interval is the 50% uh, uh, compatibility interval. And then the lighter pink intervals are 89% intervals. So you're getting a kind of top-down view on the posterior for each tank here. Uh, what I want you to see is that for the tanks that have uh, unusually low or high proportions of survival that the centers of the posterior distributions are not on the data. Uh, and this is a, a very common thing with regularized models. Remember, we're fitting the sample worse so that we can make better predictions. And I'll say that again. We're fitting the sample worse so that we can make better predictions. Uh, but there's a pattern to this fitting worse, and that is that it's the extreme tanks the ones that have um, unusually low or high survival that are the ones that the model is most skeptical of. And it, there's a pattern to the direction of its skepticism. It thinks that those tanks actually, if you're going to make a prediction for them uh, for next time, uh, it predicts that they would be closer to the mean, closer to the red horizontal dashed line. Um, and this is the partial pooling effect, the regularizing effect where if we have a good skeptical prior with a properly chosen sigma, and it turns out to be about 1.8 here, but in other cases it'd be a different value, then um, the resulting estimates will tend to have this pattern where the extreme units, the extreme tanks in this case, could be extreme cafes in the case of our coffee golem story, uh, uh, the estimates will be shrunk towards the global mean and by doing that often, we end up making better predictions in the future. This whole pattern results from the same thing that our coffee golem got by having memory about the population. And it's the prior for the tanks that is that memory. But it only becomes a memory when we do the next trick. And the next trick is we like some way to do this whole thing inside the model. So, in the example I just finished, I manipulated the value of sigma and then ran the model over and over again for different values of sigma and showed the resulting estimates. It would be nice if we could just run the model once and the model could tell us the value of sigma that gives us the best expected out of sample accuracy. Uh, could we actually learn that value of sigma, actually learn the prior, as it were, from the data? And the answer is yes. And uh, after the break, I'll show you how. Um, this material is pretty complicated. And even though this lecture isn't particularly technical, I encourage you to make good use of this break to review the preceding slides, maybe watch them again. Make sure you've got uh, some minimal understanding that'll let you keep going forward. And when you come back, I will be here. Welcome back. Let's pick up where we left off. We were looking at the tadpole data, the reed frog tadpole data, and we were building up 
to the argument about how um, the use of partial pooling and models with memory allows us to uh, find good find models that will perform well in cross-validation. And I had just uh, showed you um, the cross-validation across different levels of sigma. And now what we have on the slide is an actual multi-level model. It's a slightly modified form of the models we've used before. So I've highlighted the new bits in red in the model notation on the right. The prior for the individual tank alphas, I and mean, these alpha parameters are the log odds of survival for each tank. And this prior defines the population of tanks. It's, it holds the collective memory uh, for the machine. And there's a average tank alpha bar and some unknown standard deviation among the population of tanks sigma. And that's the variable that I had fixed uh, in the previous examples before the break. And now we're going to learn it from the data. And so to learn it from the data, we also need to give it a prior. And so I've added a prior for sigma, an exponential prior uh, on the bottom. Why the exponential prior? I've used these before. The exponential is a good default, but it's not always the right answer. Uh, it's a good default because it's a very easy prior to understand. It, the only information it contains is the average displacement from zero. So in this case, that's one. So the, the mean of the exponential is the one over uh, its uh, shape parameter, uh, its, its displacement. And so this is uh, one over one, which is still one. Um, so it's easy to understand, but it has a long tail. So sometimes you want to use something else. We'll have examples later on. Uh, otherwise, the features of this model are just as before. Uh, it's just we've put um, a new model inside it. And to help you understand why I keep saying that, if you look at the line for alpha j, it looks like uh, a likelihood. If alpha j were data, then uh, we would be modeling a normal distribution of the observations of alpha j. Uh, remember, it's, it typically all the priors up to this point in the course have had fixed numbers in them, not other variables, not, not other parameters. Uh, but now we have a model for alpha j where the shape of the prior comes from two other parameters, each of which has to be learned itself from the data. And those priors that uh, alpha bar and sigma are often called hyper priors. I say a little bit more about this terminology in the book. Uh, it's, it's not essential uh, that you use that terminology when you discuss these models, but if you hear it or see it in writing, it's good to know what's being referred to. Um, okay, let's code this model up. Oh, <laughs> apologies. Uh, before we code the model up, uh, let's look at the implications in a more human way. It's often nice, remember, to do prior predictive simulations. So let's do this for the alpha j. Let's think about it like, uh, what does the prior distribution of tanks look like here? And since it depends upon more than one parameter, we need to mush together more than one parameter to get its shape. So the, the top left, I'm showing you the exponential distribution here with a rate of 1 and uh, alpha bar is a normal 0, 1.5, just an ordinary Gaussian distribution. And then on the bottom left, uh, we have them mixed together. That is, if we sample a large number of um, values from uh, a normal distribution where the mean itself, alpha bar, is a normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation 1.5, and uh, a standard deviation sigma, which is itself a distribution, an exponential distribution, as shown in the upper left, uh, then we get the shape that I show you in the bottom left. And that is not a normal distribution uh, because its, its tails are too thick. You notice it's more dispersed than a normal distribution uh, with the same mean and variance. And that's the extra variance both from the mean, from alpha bar, and from sigma that are making the tails thicker in this distribution. But in any event, that's the implied prior distribution. And as I'm going to say multiple times, that's just a prior. The actual inferred distribution of tank survival rates doesn't have to look Gaussian just because the prior is Gaussian. Remember, at minimum, all a Gaussian prior means is that we're saying some collection of values have a mean and finite variance. And that's it. 
Okay, here's some code. Uh, I show you on the left the Ulam code for this model, and on the right um, the ordinary uh, math stats notation for a model of this kind. I hope you can see the correspondence between the two. Uh, there's no, I hope there's there's nothing really too surprising here. You can just put a bar and sigma into the norm inside the Ulam model, and it'll proceed as usual. Uh, notice at the very bottom of this code, I've added this uh, log lick. That's for log likelihood equals true, and that's because I'm going to do some uh, uh, model comparison using uh, WAIC and and important sampling in a little bit to make a point about model flexibility. Okay, run this model. It samples extremely efficiently uh, in Stan, and uh, you can get if you spit out the whole Precy table, you get this monster that I show you on the slide. There are 48 alphas uh, in addition to a bar and sigma, so there are 50 parameters total. Uh, remember, there are only 48 rows in the data set, um, but of course in Bayes we can we can have more parameters and observations. What matters is how they're structured. It's a point I'll make again in a bit. Uh, let's focus instead on sigma and, and a bar because these are the parameters that talk about the population shape and the point of this example is not really to estimate the survival rate of each uh, tadpole bucket uh, but it's to understand how the the population model inside the multi-level model creates memory and improves inferences uh, so let's see what sigma it's estimated here um, so the posterior mean as you see is about 1.6 uh, but it ranges from about 1.3 uh, to 2. Uh, there's quite a range. Let's revisit our cross-validation exercise where I varied sigma by just plugging in fixed values and fit the model over and over and calculated the important sampling score, which is, remember, an estimate of the out-of-sample performance of a model. So a way to understand the overfitting risk. Uh, if we mush these two things together now, you see that the multi-level model identifies the same range of sigmas as the cross-validation exercise did. I'll say that again. The multi-level model identifies the same range of sigmas as the cross-validation exercise does. Uh, the multi-level model learns the prior that is expected to provide the best out-of-sample accuracy for these units. And that's pretty cool. It'll be useful uh, to pull a little bit more conceptual education out of this example. Uh, it'll be useful if we also fit a model that has no memory. Uh, so on the upper left of this slide, I'm just repeating the multi-level model, the multi-level tadpole model. And then just below it, I've added a version of it uh, called uh, MST no mem, uh, where I fixed sigma to one, just to help you understand what's uh, what's happening here. So this would have been like the kinds of models I used to do the cross, uh, cross validation exercise. And for both of them, I have log like true so that I can compare them with WAIC at the bottom. Why WAIC? Uh, because WAIC is going to give us an effective number of parameters, measure a penalty term, an explicit penalty term that um, is a kind of measure of the flexibility of the model. And in, in ordinary non-Bayesian models, it is typically the no, equal to the number of parameters, the penalty term. Uh, but it won't be in Bayesian models because of priors. Let's see what it does with these two models. So here's the compare table. And unsurprisingly, the, the memory model, MST, does better. It has a smaller WAIC. You expected that because it has a better sigma value. So it has lower overfitting risk. Um, but uh, look at the, the PWAIC column. That's the penalty term, sometimes called the effective number of parameters. And um, there are uh, 50 parameters in, in the MST model and only one less in MST NOMEM. Uh, both of them have way less uh, effective, way fewer uh, effective number of parameters than that, though, uh, half or less. Um, but notice that. Uh, MST, even though it has one more parameter than MST nomem, actually has fewer effective parameters. I'll say that again. Even though MST, which is the multi-level model, has one more parameter, sigma, sigma is free in that model, uh, free meaning flexible, uh, even though it has one more parameter than the other model, MST nomem, it ends up with fewer effective parameters. Uh, 
And that's because uh, by fitting sigma, it ends up being a less flexible model uh, or having the, the proper amount of, of flexibility so it makes better predictions. This is a very weird phenomenon uh, in Bayesian inference, but it's not unusual. Adding parameters can actually reduce the overfitting risk of a model. What matters is not the number of parameters, but how they're structured. And once you start making priors dependent upon other priors, as we've done here, then a lot of a wide world of really interesting statistical things can happen. Uh, which are not dreamt of in introductory statistics courses. So I do encourage you to discard um, the lessons. Well, discard's a strong word. Do not assume that the lessons you learned about basic regression models or basic tests like t-tests or ANOVAs uh, apply to more complicated models, um, multi-level models, neural networks, and the like, because typically they don't. Okay, let's interrogate the model a bit more. There's some more to learn from this simple model still. Uh, so what I've done here is, again, I've plotted the uh, proportions of survival in each tank using the black dots. Those are just the empirical results. And then in the red and pink, I've put up the uh, estimates, the alphas for each tank. And the, the pink um, compatibility region, that's the 89% uh, region for each. And the uh, circle is the posterior mean. This is all on the probability scale. Um, now, what I want you to see uh, peering at this, I, I know it's a bit confusing, but just focus on the left side for a second where the small tanks are. Uh, and look at the distance in each case between uh, the corresponding um, empirical result, the, the black dot, and the red estimate, the posterior mean. And you'll see uh, that there are lots of cases where they don't overlap. And this is the, you understand why, we already talked about this before the break. Uh, this is a result of uh, regularization, of trying to avoid overfitting. But measure those distances, the size of them with your eyes, if you can for a second, and, and then gaze quickly over to the far right and make the same comparison. Uh, the large tanks on the far right exhibit the same phenomenon, that is, especially the more extreme tanks near the bottom have greater distances between the empirical black point and the red estimate, just as on the far left. However, the distances in absolute size are much smaller on the far right than they are in the far left. And why is that? And that's because there's more evidence in the large tanks. There are more tadpoles. And so there's more information with which to inform the particular estimate of each tank on the far right than on the far left. And as a result, the estimates on the far left are informed more by the population estimate, that is the memory part of the model, is having a stronger effect on the small tanks because the small tanks contain less data. So there's two things to see here in summary. The first is that uh, extreme estimates tend to show, uh, under optimal estimation, a greater distance between the empirical result and what the model expects in the long run, in future data from that unit. That's the gap between the red circle and the black dot. Uh, and second, the more information in a particular unit, the less the population distribution matters, and the more that unit contributes to the population, and therefore the more that unit will influence other points that have less data. Think about the, the coffee golem. Uh, the coffee golem uh, really exploited this property, but it did so automatically just through the structure of the model. Right? You don't have to be clever to make all these cool things about estimation work. You just have to have the scientific structure of the model right. And then probability theory does the rest. Okay, another thing uh, to notice about this simple model, uh, this is an experiment and there are treatments and I omitted them from the model. Nevertheless, they show up. Uh, it's like the, the, the estimates for each tank are, in a sense, haunted by the treatment because these estimates uh, from this kind of model are very flexible and they can find treatments if the treatments have large effects, even if you don't uh, tell the model that the treatments exist. And that's what's happened here. So what I'll, all I've done is I've repeated the previous slide, but I've colored um, the points by treatment, uh, focusing on the predator treatment. So the blue tanks are the ones where the they were shielded from predators. I believe in the original experiment they were covered uh, 
uh, and then the uh, red ones are ones that were not protected from predators. And you'll notice that the red ones tend to suffer uh, lower average survival, uh, unsurprising. Um, however, uh, this model knows nothing about the predator treatment because I did not even give it that variable. Um, so it has found it, uh, nevertheless. Uh, there's an interesting thing that comes from now comparing these estimates to the model where we do tell it about predators. Uh, so let's do that now. Uh, let's stratify the mean of the population by predators. This is kind of like saying there are going to be two populations of tanks now, and they have different means. There's the non-predator mean and the predator mean. And I'm going to uh, there's different ways to code this. Again, we're in the realm of choosing functions now, so your imagination is the only limit. Uh, but I'm going to do the simplest thing and just add, uh, uh, use a dummy variable, p sub i, for the presence uh, of predators, and use this coefficient beta sub p for the incremental effect on the mean of the presence of predators. And now you're expecting this to be negative, and I, but I'm just going to go ahead and assign a, a normal prior centered on zero. Not the best choice in the world, uh, but certainly a neutral one. Um, there are no new obstacles in coding this. Uh, I'll show you the code here. Just add um, BP times P and then add a prior for the new beta coefficient there in the model. You won't be surprised to see that the posterior distribution of this new coefficient, BP, is resoundingly negative, uh, and it's a whopping huge effect. So the x-axis here is still on the log odds, so uh, almost minus two log odds on average. That's a devastating reduction in survival. But of course, you could see that from the graph, right? You could see that with your eyes. Um, this gives us more because it gives us a measure of the precision, of course, and uh, uh, even the mildest effect is quite negative. Even if it were only minus one, that would be a big effect. But let's look at something else here. So let's compare the implied posterior predictions of the two models. So what I've done here on the horizontal, so I've plotted the probability of survival from the model without predators. That's the first one we did, the, the multi, first multi-level model that I fit after the break. And then on the vertical, I plotted the model we just did. And this is also a multi-level model, but with the dummy variable for predators added. And again, the, the blue points are the tanks where predators were absent, and the red points are the tanks where predators were present. And uh, the diagonal is the line of equality. And you'll see that the models make extremely similar predictions across all the tanks. There are some that are a little bit different, and we could inspect that and think hard about why. Uh, but that's not the point I want to make with this. It's that the models make extremely similar predictions. And that's a, that's a testament to how flexible these uh, multi-level models are. They often find structure in the data, um, even when you haven't told it about the structure being there. Okay, and let's also look at the sigmas that were estimated here. And you can see there's been a big change, even though the predictions are extremely similar, adding the treatment, the predator treatment explicitly, has had a big effect on the estimated variation in the population of tanks. Uh, so the red density on the right is the sigma posterior distribution from the model with predators. And uh, the blue one is from the first multi-level model, the one where the model was ignorant of the predator treatment. Uh, so what has happened here is that uh, the model with predators is able to explain variation among tanks using the predator treatment. And so the variation left to uh, explain with the alphas is smaller, uh, quite a lot smaller, as you can see. Uh, this is a very common thing with multi-level models, is that as you start to add in treatments uh, or, or other variables that um, are associated with the outcome, that the variation uh, among uh, the multi-level estimates, the alphas in this model, uh, gets smaller. Um, one consequence of this is that it's often quite useful uh, in more, uh, uh, say, richly structured multi-level models, like the ones we'll meet next week, uh, to start with a model that has none of the treatments and other things that interest you, actually, because it's a way to assess the structure of the variation at the different levels of the model. And that often is extremely helpful.
for understanding the size of the effects that you're seeing. Okay, uh, I want to wrap up the tadpole example for now. Uh, the multi-level models um, are distinguished by having a model of the unobserved population. Where we can't see the population of tadpoles. We can't see the population of cafes. It may not even really exist except as some statistical device that we use to help our estimates. Uh, it's, it's a kind of machine memory. Uh, but it has a huge and positive effect. It helps us learn about the observed units. Uh, and it does that in two ways. Uh, first, it, it uses the data more efficiently uh, so that each unit can actually tell you something about the other units in the data. Each cafe, the coffee golem visited, would tell it about other cafes as well. And that's a more efficient use of its experience than being ignorant of the idea that cafes are somewhat similar to one another, that they're the same type of thing. Uh, likewise, uh, the tanks in the tadpole data are different, uh, but they're also alike. And so if we treat them as being from some statistical population, obviously there's not a real population of buckets full of tadpoles in the world, but if they're from some statistical population, we can learn about them more efficiently. And that also uh, simultaneously reduces overfitting to help us make better predictions. These types of estimates in multi-level models, the alphas in the tadpole example, are often called varying effects. Uh, one way you can think about this is that the, the estimates vary across units, or they're unit-specific, partially pooled estimates. What's important is the use of partial pooling through the device of the population model uh, that's run at the same time as the observation model. That's what matters. There's a bunch of confusing terminology in this literature, uh, but if you um, insist upon seeing the model specification uh, of the types that I've been showing you in the course, you can always demystify what was actually done in any particular uh, study. Okay, there are still um, uninspected variables in the DAG in the bottom right of this slide, like density D and size g. We, we used density already in the model, but we only used it as the number of tadpoles that could survive. It could have other effects as well, uh, and size could have big effects because large tadpoles, this is the size of the tadpoles, large tadpoles um, have better defense possibly against predators. Uh, but we're not going to deal with those in this lecture. I'm going to leave those for your fun in a homework problem. To end up this lecture, I want to talk about uh, superstitions instead. And there's lots of superstition in statistics. And I'm very sympathetic to the fact that it exists because humans are a, uh, a superstitious species. It just seems to be how our cognition works. Um, but there are some risks to that. And in the uh, case of varying effects, uh, the superstitions lead people um, to not use varying effects as often as they should. And then they, they give up statistical power. Uh, I just want to talk about three, uh, which are, in my experience, the most common types of superstitions. Uh, the first is that the units uh, that you're stratifying the varying effects by must have been sampled at random rather than being some aspect of the design of your study. Uh, and this is false. Uh, think about the coffee golem. Now, of course, the coffee golem is not real data, but that somehow makes it better because it's... It, we have the generative process for it and the statistical analysis. Um, the, the cafes could be an exhaustive population of cafes in Prague. Uh, the golem is still going to learn more efficiently if it uses a multi-level model in its little rock brain uh, than a non-multi-level model. Uh, it doesn't matter that, that units are sampled at random. Um, lurking behind this, this uh, fallacy is this idea that random is some real thing in the world, right, that people do. Uh, uh, at the scale that people live, everything's deterministic, and random is just a, an epistemological statement. When we sample units at random, what that mean is, means is we have shielded ourselves from the knowledge of what actually determined any particular unit in, an, in, in any particular unit ending up in our sample. It's purely epistemology. It's our, it's our knowledge blindness. Um, this is not a criterion by which you decide which type of estimator to use. Typically, partially pooled estimates are going to be superior uh, to non-pooled or completely pooled estimates. 
um, just because they reduce overfitting. Uh, the second uh, fallacy or superstition is that the number of units must be large. Um, this is also not true. Uh, I will say that it, it's practically true in the case of non-Bayesian estimation techniques, uh, but it is not true um, in Bayesian techniques. And you saw this again in the coffee golem example. Uh, we could we could do partial pooling with one cafe already and get a population estimate and then as soon as we visit the second cafe just with one more data point uh, we already can do um, a multi-level estimation uh, so that's that's not an obstacle at all and sometimes this is useful and realistic just because you don't have a lot of data that's not an excuse to use the wrong scientific model the third uh, Often you'll hear it said that um, um, these varying effect estimates assume that the population effects have a Gaussian distribution and that uh, this fallacy arises uh, from a very natural observation. So I can understand why people think this. It's because when you read the model formula, you see a normal distribution assigned to them. And if you think of them like you think about outcomes, uh, maybe you think that the frequency distribution will be Gaussian, but of course, uh, in neither case, not for parameters like the alphas, nor for observable outcomes, is does assigning a Gaussian distribution to them mean that their frequency distribution is Gaussian. It just means that the prior of the residuals is Gaussian. The posterior distribution is free to have any shape it needs to if there's conflict between the prior and the likelihood. You've already seen an example of this, in fact, from lecture 10, and I copy it on the slide here. You may remember I did this example where we were trying to deconfound the UC Berkeley um, uh, data, um, graduate admissions data. And I had an example where I had, I had showed you that the confound could mask discrimination uh, in structures of that type. And I had simulated um, differences in ability. Those are the U values on the horizontal axis on the graph on the right. And I had done it in a binary fashion. I had just created people with value zero who are average and people with value one who were excellent, who were really good, highly qualified individuals, I think I said in the lecture. And then we can run a Bayesian model that is, uh, has U in it and assumes some effects. That is that the U value an individual has um, will help them uh, get admitted and also uh, lead them to apply to different departments. And we estimated the underlying distribution of views, and as you see, the, the posterior distributions, even though I assigned a Gaussian prior to the U's, and you see it there, uh, normal zero one, um, the model identified the clusters, and it had no problem doing that. Uh, prior is just a prior. The posterior can take a different shape. Okay. Varying effects are a really good default, and I believe majority of the time when scientists are doing some kind of regression problem with repeat observations and clusters. Um, varying effects are usually what they need to use, best thing for them to use. If you don't use them, it's not the end of the world. They're, they, they're better, uh, but in many cases, they're not essential. Um, that said, uh, there are practical difficulties in using them. And so part of, of teaching you how to use these models is not just how to build them and interpret them, but also how to make them if, um, run correctly. And uh, there are uh, co complexities that just have to do with writing the code and not with writing the model. Uh, and what I mean by that is the same mathematically expressed statistical model can be coded different ways. And those different ways of coding it can really matter. And starting in the next lecture next week, uh, we're going to look at this. We're going to look at two issues in particular. Uh, how to code multi-level models that have more than one type of cluster at the same time. For example, in the trolley problem data, we have stories and we have participants, and we'd like to include them both at the same time. How can we have the model have two populations inside of it and structure them appropriately together in the response predictions? And then second, how do we make these, these models sample efficiently? And uh, we're going to uh, look, come back to skateboarding and divergent transitions again and think about basically deforming the skate park to make the machine run better. Okay, that has been week six in your introduction to multi-level models.
And uh, starting next week, we'll have a full week of multi-level models um, looking at uh, more complicated things like uh, uh, multiple population types and varying slopes and other sorts of fun things you may or may not have heard of. And uh, that'll provide a strong foundation to get into a bigger world of models that um, have models within models. That is the multi-level technique opens uh, a big um, horizon for us. And I'll see you there.